Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the IDSAT Network. Hope you all having a great day. Today's discussion is on early 20th century English literature. And for discussion on this topic, we have with us in the studio Professor Bhim Singh Dhaiya. He has been uh, teaching as Professor of English as Kurukshetra, at Kurukshetra University. He was also the Vice Chancellor at Kurukshetra University. Now, he is the President of the Shakespeare Association of India. He has more than two dozen books on literature, education and politics. His current book is A New History of English Literature and uh, we are very privileged to have him here with us today to speak on early 20th century English literature. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, early 20th century literature uh, is called modernist literature. Like the 19th century, 20th century also falls into two parts two distinct movements. In the 19th century, we had the Romantic movement and then the Victorian movement. Similarly, here in the 20th century, we have a modernist movement and then the postmodernist movement after World War II. So today, we will be talking about uh, uh, the first phase of 20th century, the movement called the modernist movement. This movement actually uh, was uh, a combination of several minor movements, beginning with uh, uh, art for art's sake, uh, aestheticism, vorticism, surrealism, so on and so forth. So many isms combined together came to be known as modernism. And the high priest of uh, uh, European modernism or English modernism were Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot. Ezra Pound was mm, quite a dictatorial uh, dominant figure in the movement. Uh, that is one indicator because both were uh, American. So it is for the first time in the 20th century in English literature that the center of power has shifted from England to America. Not only in politics, because World War I was won by the Western forces with the help of America. And America, therefore, came on the scene of world politics after World War I. So politically, then in business, as also in literature, America assumed leadership after World War I, that is 1918 onward. Now, these movements also, like uh, earlier movements in uh, uh, literary history, are never without background ideas, thoughts, because literature is not a self-contained uh, narrative. It is always dependent upon the entire milieu, uh, social, political, philosophic, intellectual, a milieu of any age, uh, that mm, forms the background for literature. So here also some of the names are important. One of the most important was Spengler, a German writer. Spengler wrote a book called uh, Decline of the West. And that idea uh, became very predominant in uh, uh, modernist literature. Eliot's The Wasteland, for example, is all about uh, the decline of the West, the culture, the civilization of the West. Similarly, James Joyce's novel Ulysses, and before that, uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Uh, these novels also are about the decline of the West. Similarly, D.H. Lawrence's novels, 
or Virginia Woolf's novels. Now, uh, all these writers were engaged uh, with this problem of the decline. Of course, each uh, in his or her own way responded to it and uh, offered solutions. But the subject was common. The problem was common to all. Another important name for uh, the modernist literature was Bergson. You see, Bergson challenged the Greek sources of reason and logic. And uh, he said, everything cannot be explained through the Greek concepts of reason and logic. And that made an impact. You can see that. Even uh, uh, the literary forms changed. You no longer has the linear forms, the organic forms, as you had in the 19th century. Uh, now, you see, uh, there are dislocations like the wasteland. You can see the structure of wasteland or its form is not organic. It is inorganic. It is broken, uh, pieces put together, sort of patchwork. Uh, similarly, uh, Ulysses. Uh, Ulysses uh, mm, is in fact a parody of the Iliad, sorry, Odyssey. And uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, there is a correspondence between the original and the parody. Uh, this also has another aspect. You see, uh, you have a writer called um, John Barth in America. He wrote an article called uh, The Literature of Exhaustion. Uh, the idea is that most literary forms uh, stand exhausted. Uh, so many great writers have used those forms, beginning with the epic writers, then the dramatists, then the poets, and finally the novelists. And uh, the, the writer in the 20th century uh, cannot think of, you see, surpassing them or uh, competing with them. At best, they can do either the patchwork or write parodies. So literature of exhaustion. And that's why you have uh, poems like uh, The Wasteland or uh, Pound's Cantos, or Pound's Hugh Selwyn Moberly, which is a sequence poem. You see, 19 short poems uh, pieced together uh, makes a new form. Uh, or Hemingway's In Our Time, uh, a, a sequence of short stories. So th that is how things changed in the 20th century. Still another influence on the modernist writers was that of uh, uh, Sigmund Freud. You know his famous books, uh, Interpretation of Dreams, or Civilization and Its Discontents. I'd say his attack was also on the rationality of Western philosophy, beginning with the Greeks, uh, Socrates, then Plato, then Aristotle, and so on than the Romans. And uh, he said, no, uh, uh, a man's life is governed by many things which are irrational, including dreams, your visions, your hallucinations, your obsessions, so on and so forth. And that's why there came about a change in literature. Uh, you can see Virginia Woolf uh, or Lawrence or James Joyce, more relying upon uh, uh, the non-rational experiences of life and trying to interpret life uh, uh, in these terms provided by Freudian, uh, the unconscious or the subconscious or the racial memory, uh, Jung later. So oh, all that goes into literature. Uh, 
Then uh, still another name, you see, even before um, Freud, uh, you have uh, William James. You know the brother of Henry James, who was a novelist. Uh, William James was a psychologist. And in fact, the first modern book of psychology he wrote, and the term which we in literary criticism use so often, uh, uh, stream of consciousness. That term is given by William James. And you have the stream of consciousness novel uh, in, uh, done by Virginia Woolf. And then interior monologue, uh, Joyce's, Ulysses, or even the portrait of the artist, uh, both uh, rely for narrative on the interior monologue. So the entire methodology of literary narrative changes because of these new ideas that came. And like uh, the earlier movements, uh, there was also behind the modernist movement a great historical event. And that was World War I. World War I from 1914 to 1918 you see, was a great shock to the Western world. And uh, two things came out of this, so far as literature is concerned. One, I've already mentioned, decline of the West, that idea. And they thought uh, humanism had failed. Because from Renaissance onward, uh, 15th century, uh, Europe, uh, there has been heavy reliance upon values derived from the philosophy of humanism because Renaissance movement was a uh, humanist movement or uh, Reformation was another Renaissance Reformation. So uh, humanism, man-centered philosophy rather than God. Medieval philosophy was God-centered. But Renaissance philosophy was man-centered. And uh, uh, that's why all human values were derived, keeping in view the interests of man, welfare of man, uh, progress of man. But uh, World War I gave a shock. And the writers felt that uh, humanism had failed. Where is humanism? Where are those values? Man is as beastly as any time. Uh, here also relevant uh, is um, Darwin. You see, Darwin uh, demolished uh, the biblical version of the creation of God. Sorry, a creation of man, humanity. Uh, he said man is like any other species of life and it has evolved more than others. Therefore, it's ruling, dominating, and so on. It has mind developed, other species do not have. But tremendous study and that had its own impact. Similarly, uh, there came the Nietzsche, death of God uh, theory. Uh, that also is related to the uh, Darwinian idea of struggle for existence and uh, survival of the fittest. And that is what many of the writers uh, show uh, there. So these were uh, some of the ideas that went into the modernist literature. Uh, meanwhile, another thing, because of these ideas, because of these events, uh, another thing that had happened uh, significant in the 20th century was the, the isolation of the, the artist from the society. You see, earlier you do not find um, that isolation. Of course, separation had begun with the romantics. Because the romantics got disenchanted with the uh, urban civilization. And that's why Wordsworth gave a call for return to nature. And they left London, Cambridge, Oxford, and set up their cottages in the countryside and lived there. 
Wordsworth, Coleridge, Sade, all of these writer poets, they lived in the countryside. So uh, that separation had started there. Victorians, of course, through their compromise, they tried to patch up uh, the separation and uh, uh, tried to bring back the artist to society. That's why novel became more prominent during the Victorian age because novel was directly addressing people and was not separating the artist from society. Dickens, Thackeray, Trollope, uh, then later Hardy, George Eliot, all of them, uh, they were men of, uh, and women of society, uh, writing for the people, living among the people, uh, feeling the pulse of uh, the time, and uh, narrating those stories, narrating their time, narrating history. But then when you come to the 20th century, you find a complete uh, separation, isolation. The writer, uh, there is a book also by David Ditches, I think, the writer in the modern world, uh, where he's, he talks of the same problem, of uh, the isolation. Uh, there is no sharing of values. No sharing of perspective now between the artist and uh, and uh, the society. That's why in Wasteland you can see that uh, the characters are almost alien to the artist. He is uh, looking from uh, afar. He's looking from a different uh, position, looking down upon them or looking towards them, but not among them. He is not there. Similarly, uh, say James Joyce, uh, even Virginia Woolf, highly uh, isolated artist writing about uh, lonely life, even our own, and talking of uh, those hallucinations, suicide. In every novel of her, there is a suicide. And unfortunately, ultimately, she also committed suicide. Uh, similarly, Lawrence uh, has very radical ideas uh, which cannot be shared with the society. They, they are very different. So uh, th this is another aspect of the modernist uh, literature. Uh, yet another is because of this isolation, and because of uh, their feeling that uh, all forms of literature had already uh, been exhausted, uh, they took to experimentation. So it is also called, besides age of modernism, age of experimentation. Because it was modern in this sense. It was modern in this sense that uh, uh, large-scale experimentation in poetry, in novel, in drama, you can see that. Uh, the Wasteland is the best example of experimentation. E. E. Cummings made other experiments, including short letters, uh, no capital letter, and so on. And uh, then in the form, uh, having geometrical forms rather than regular stanza, uh, traditional form, and so on. Similarly, in the novel, uh, stream of consciousness novel, <coughs> sorry. And then uh, D.H. Lawrence uh, making uh, uh, new experiments uh, in the narrative. Science fiction, H.G. Wells, again, new kind of literature, which was not there in the uh, 19th century, of course, beginnings had been made. You know Mary Shelley. Uh, she was the first one to write uh, science fiction in a way, uh, Frankenstein and The Last Man. Last Man is slightly different, but Frankenstein is science fiction. Uh, but then in the 20th century, in a big way, it came. And experimentation in uh, drama theater, uh, you know, uh, Eugene O'Neill or Arthur Miller, again, both American, dominating. 
Uh, here, of course, you had H.G. Wells, Goldsworthy, or Bernard Shaw. But compared to these Americans, uh, these uh, British uh, dramatists sound rather uh, traditionalists because they are writing social drama rather than experimental drama. The Americans are writing experimental drama. Uh, later you know uh, come, uh, who is afraid of Virginia Woolf and so on. That, of course, uh, takes us to World War II. But the experimentation is uh, one very strong aspect of uh, modernism. Experimentations in not only forms, in language. Uh, you don't have the Victorian language. There was a sharp reaction against the Victorian morality and the Victorian inhibitions, uh, not uh, writing about many subjects. For example, the kind of things Lawrence talks about were not possible in the Victorian age. But now in the 20th century, it is possible. So language which is free, frank, uh, innovative, uh, novel altogether. So uh, inventions, innovations, uh, these become the hallmarks of uh, uh, modernist uh, uh, literature uh, in the uh, early uh, 20th century. Uh, Yeah, as I said, uh, uh, this aspect uh, of world war being at the back of it, just like the, uh, you know, uh, industrial revolution was at the back of the 18th century literature, uh, neoclassical. And then the French Revolution was at the back of uh, the romantic literature. And uh, uh, then uh, when you come to uh, the modernist literature, besides World War I, you also had the Russian Revolution of 1918, 1917. So uh, that Russian uh, Revolution also had its impact. Uh, one impact was that it divided the world into two, the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc. Western Bloc, capitalism and Eastern Bloc communism. And that divided literature also. Uh, you know, in the 1930s, we were talking largely of 1920s. Uh, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, uh, Virginia Woolf, D.H. Lawrence, James Joyce. But when you come to the 30s, you see a significant change uh, in writing because of the Russian Revolution. Well, many of the leading writers were drawn to uh, uh, the East, Eastern Europe, and drawn to Marxism, because they thought uh, this was perhaps uh, an answer to the failure of capitalism. The failure of capitalism was indicated by, you know, the famous uh, Wall Street crash of 1929. Wall Street is the stock exchange of America in New York. So that crashed in 1929, and uh, all economies of the Western countries, America and Western Europe, uh, they had tremendous recession. Uh, millions of people going out of jobs, uh, the hungry people, so on and so forth. So obviously, uh, that was reason enough for the writers to get drawn to Marxism, because in Eastern Europe, there was no recession, uh, no economic failure. So they thought perhaps this was a better alternative. That's why uh, in the 30s, you have uh, a group of co poets called the Auden Group, W.H. Auden. He was the leader of that group. Then you had Stephen Spender, uh, C.D. Lewis, Louis McNeese, so all these poets, uh, they were, uh, uh, you say, in a way, uh, inclined to Marxism and leftism. And that's why they gave a new kind of poetry, writing about factory workers, writing about industry, train, glorifying industry, 
and not taking it as something unpoetical and so on. You remember uh, Spender wrote a poem on the express uh, train as if it's a beauty queen and so on. So uh, things changed. Uh, in America also, you know, Hemingway was drawn to uh, Marxism. Then Steinbeck, he was drawn to Marxism. Arthur Miller, he was drawn to Marxism. So, so many writers in the 30s, they turned to Marxism uh, because of the influence of Russian Revolution and uh, the economy not failing there. Uh, it was the impact of World War I, of course, because war means waste of your resources. And uh, the West won the war, but they lost the war on the economic front, and uh, they went bankrupt. And that had its impact because literature is immediately affected by uh, whatever happens in any society, in any country, in any block. And that impact we can see very clearly uh, there. In drama, for example, O'Neill uh, is making uh, experiments uh, with myth, with dream, and writing about uh, the common man, uh, Arthur Miller, you remember, Death of a Salesman. Willie Lohman is a common man, Aam Admi. And he's writing about his life and uh, how his family life is conditioned by the uh, situation, historical situation around him and so on. Is that all right or do we continue? <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, then we can uh, take up these, you say, forms separately because you have uh, literary theory, because a new theory also came up. You know, the romantic theory was poem is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. That is what poetry was for Wordsworth, or emotion recollected in tranquility. Now that continued even during the Victorian period, uh, this sort of romanticism, except that they modified it with the idea of uh, having some moral. So uh, Victorian moralism. Uh, that's why Matthew Arnold or uh, mm, mm, Tennyson or Browning, all of them uh, always have some sort of moral tag to the poem they are writing. Even in the novel, Dickens, uh, no novel is without a moral. Uh, it has a message. It may be social, it may be political, it may be uh, spiritual, but message is always there. So they uh, were writing for this. But when you come to the 20th century, uh, you find the whole perspective uh, changes. Now, uh, the poetics of uh, the modernist movement is just the opposite of the romantic poetics. Poetry now is no longer a spontaneous overflow. You remember the slogans by uh, Ezra Pound, the leader of the movement, he gave two slogans. One was, uh, make poetry new. The other was, make it difficult. That's why you have a poem like The Wasteland. Technically very difficult. Only a specialist can comprehend. A common reader cannot. Earlier literature was being written for the common man, but now it is being written by a specialist. So this is another phenomenon of the 20th century that uh, disciplines uh, become specialized. Uh, not only literature, every other discipline. So uh, the poetics also becomes a specialized area, even literature, not only literary criticism, literature also becomes a specialized area uh, how many common readers, for example, can enjoy uh, the wasteland? They wouldn't be able to make out anything. 
similarly, Joyce is uh, Ulysses. Common reader cannot make out anything. Even in the case of Virginia Woolf, the same problem. Unless you know uh, Bergson, unless you know William James, unless you know, uh, you see, Sigmund Freud, you would not follow uh, what is happening in the novel. So uh, uh, the poetics changes, poetics of poetry, poetics of the novel, poetics, poetics of the theater also. Theater also becomes a more sophisticated uh, you see, art. Uh, you can see in uh, uh, Arthur Miller or uh, uh, O'Neill um, how the stage now has become highly uh, uh, technical, controlled by modern technology. You have light and shade, and you have uh, other, you see, settings which were not available earlier. So uh, these changes come about uh, uh, as a sort of experimentation uh, and as a reaction against the 19th century. So things, uh, the poetics changes in all the three uh, major branches of literature, uh, poetry, novel, and drama. So no longer spontaneous overflow. Uh, in fact, uh, T.S. Eliot makes fun of it uh, in his uh, critical essays. Uh, he twists and turns these phrases by Wordsworth and ridicules them. Uh, similarly, he ridicules uh, Matthew Arnold uh, because now uh, they don't believe in all that. Uh, they, they think uh, they need to give a shock to the Western civilization. And only through that shock you can bring back uh, to senses. So that's why poetics also changes. You have a literature which is not there to soothe uh, the powerful feelings, uh, spontaneous overflow, and the emotion recollected in tranquility, have uh, a, a basic premise, which is that literature is to give you soothing effect. Uh, the joys and sorrows of life, pleasures and pains of life, now, uh, they are suffering humanity has to be healed. And literature gives you healing. That's why you turn to literature, reading a novel and so on, for pleasure. But now they say, no. Do you derive any pleasure reading uh, The Wasteland or Ulysses? Uh, it becomes all the more painful because they want to shock you into recognition that this is what life is around you. It is hard life. There is no soothing matter. So uh, you, you get a very different kind of poetics, a very different kind of literature uh, because of these changes, reaction. Uh, in, if it is very interesting to see that in English literature right from the beginning, uh, and even before English literature, Roman and uh, Greek, there have been actions and reactions. Just as in physics you read, action and reaction uh, are equal and opposite. So uh, Renaissance literature led to neoclassical literature. Neoclassical literature led to romantic literature, romantic to Victorian, Victorian to modern, modern to postmodern. So reactions keep taking place to uh, what was earlier there. And uh, that's why it becomes a chain. And you cannot really study literature of any age or any movement in isolation. Right. You have to have a knowledge of history. You have to relate one movement with another. Only then you get uh, the complete view of it, uh, the whole story. Otherwise, your knowledge will be partial, incomplete. And uh, many things are misunderstood like uh, that. So uh, these actions and reactions are very important. 
and that's why Elliot and Pound and others, they were reacting very strongly against the 19th century. They thought it was just uh, adolescent or uh, immature uh, literature, or just for soothing like baby <laughs> uh, entertainment. And Victorian novel is like that. It is entertaining, you know. Uh, Dickens's novels used to be serialized, and uh, weekly magazines will, you see, carry out chapter after chapter. And uh, every week, then, he will be flooded with a lot of letters, readers writing, please do this with this character, or don't do that with the character. So this kind of uh, community uh, participation in the production of literature was the 19th century phenomenon. But then in the 20th century, there is no such uh, you see, communication between the reader and the writer. There is complete separation and isolation uh, between the two. And uh, uh, that's why no communication uh, is there. And uh, Eliot is not writing for communicating with you, or the common reader, or the society. If at all mm, if, uh, he wants to convey anything, it is a shock that he wants to convey. Similarly, D. H. Lawrence wants to shock you to certain uh, realities which you uh, keep under the carpet. In the Victorian era, uh, things inhibited, things forbidden, they were kept under the carpet, yes. but now they uh, removed the carpet and want to show you all. So that is what modern literature is about, both in England and America, in America more. As I said, now the uh, center shifts to America, and they assume leadership. So much so that uh, Pound and Elliot, they came to England and dominated the scene here. Uh, even uh, older writers like uh, W.B. Yeats, when he came to know that Pound had come to London, he goes running and shows his poems to him. <laughs> and he said, no, no, this is nonsense. So on and so forth. He was very self-opinionated, uh, very domineering. Um, uh, but unfortunately, anti-democracy and anti-science. In fact, in, I wrote in my history also, it is very strange that uh, the leading writers of this movement of the 20s called modernism, they bullied the whole world into ad accepting them as the only modernists. Even Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Goldsworthy, uh, were not admitted to modernism. They said they are contemporaries, they are not modern. And you remember Stephen Spender wrote a book uh, uh, where he makes out a distinction between uh, the modern and the contemporary. So the moderns are one who are making experiments, who are giving uh, new perspectives, and contemporaries are continuing in the traditional narrative form with the traditional values of the 19th century and so on. But uh, not these writers. Uh, they changed uh, everything. Any question? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. I was, uh, yeah. I was wanting to because intervene. I, yes. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I understood that the writers of 1930s were making a move towards Eastern Europe. <coughs> they were, uh, as uh, you mentioned, they were drawn towards Marxism. Uh, was W.H. Auden one of those who was moving uh, towards uh, Eastern Europe in 1930s? And as you mentioned uh, there were a number of other writers who were also disillusioned with their current places and they moved to mm, another place yeah. and uh, was this uh, a movement productive uh, was it helpful to them in any way were they any happier to make that transition not really uh, because later uh, there was a counter uh, say revolution 
And all of these writers got disenchanted and they came back, so much so that Auden settled in America. Right. And not in Moscow. <laughs> he chose America uh, uh, for settling. Uh, so, and uh, similarly, uh, the other younger writers like Stephen Spender. Uh, they went back to uh, the uh, original Western uh, culture, Western philosophy, Western values, and distanced themselves from Marxism. Very few stayed there. Uh, George Orwell, even he uh, uh, retraced, Hemingway retraced, uh, Arthur Miller did. So most of these writers, uh, for some years, in the 30s, of course, there was enthusiasm. But after the 30s, it cooled down. Right. Because very soon began the World War II then. Yes. And they saw the gain there. For example, uh, we'll talk about it next time, uh, 1937, the Spanish Civil War. Yes. And Hemingway, in For Whom the Bill Tolls, he exposes the Russians also there, uh, that each group, it may be the American or it may be Russian, they are playing their own game. And Spain, poor country, uh, they are being victimized. Uh, they are being played upon. And they are being destroyed, their economy, their people, and so on. So uh, this disenchantment, of course, uh, is not merely with Marxism but also with, uh, you see, capitalism. So they don't, uh, they didn't know for some time where to go. Right. So they, they were saw looking one for hope, a but that hope also failed to. them. In fact, there came uh, uh, a book those days called The God That Failed, which was Marxism. Marxism failed. Marx is God. Right. And uh, many of these writers uh, they made personal statements which were published in that book uh, that I stand by uh, mm. these ideas and so on. Okay, any other? Uh, sir, uh, uh, during the 1930s, uh, a lot of war poetry was being written. Mm. Say, people like uh, we discussed, uh, people were resenting against the idea of a war. And uh, normally one associates uh, with soldiers the fact that it is a glorious thing to die for one's nation. But uh, what was coming across through this poetry in 1930s was that the soldiers were very disappointed by the cause of war. It was being felt that these are pointless wars being uh, fought and they were being led to for, uh, fight instead of uh, their own will to fight. So uh, was it... Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, say uh, for real or uh, was it just the opinion of the poet? No, very true. I think uh, you are right and uh, that is a big difference between the 19th century or any other earlier century and the 20th. Because in the 20th for the first time uh, you have, uh, you see, uh, writers, poets, dramatists, novelists, participating in war, first in World War I and then World War II. In fact, in World War I, uh, there is a whole class of uh, war poets, and there are anthologies of war poetry and so on. Now, these poets themselves, you see, saw what happens in war. And um, uh, they, they were disenchanted. Earlier, uh, you don't have writers who actually participated in war. A Tennyson could glorify the war, or Browning could, but uh, uh, not these 20th century poets because they saw it they themselves. They saw the realities. They knew at first hand what war really means. The other difference is that world war uh, was first time world war on that scale. Right. Of course, if you go to ancient in uh, ancient history, Greek or Roman, uh, they were also world wars in a way. But uh, uh, the modern technological war, 
was fought for the first time. Because there, in the ancient times, or even in the medieval times, or even until the end of the 19th century, wars were physical, man to man. Yes. There were no machines. But now, with the drop of a bomb, you can destroy the whole city, or whole population, and so on. So they saw this happening. And this was shocking to anyone. Are we mad? Why, why is it happening? Is this what we had been glorifying in poetry, in other forms of literature? So they wrote anti-war uh, poems, a lot of them, and anti-war novels also, anti-war drama. So there was quite a movement, but unfortunately another war came. Yes, sir. Uh, their protests had no uh, difference. They couldn't make. After all, uh, literature has very limited relevance that way. Uh, Auden said that, that poetry makes nothing happen. So happenings come from our thinking of the politicians, not of the poets. Poets, yes. Poets are uh, soft people that way because they think for the welfare of humanity, for peace, for love. Uh, but politicians will make, uh, you see, hard calculations of gains, political gains, territory. You are conquering other countries, having rule over them. So he wouldn't bother about the cost of it. But a poet would look into the cost. Millions of people killed. You see, so many deaths they had not seen ever before. Because there were not, no bombs earlier. No bombs earlier. In World War, uh, there were no nuclear bomb, but, but other bombs were there, uh, which could destroy, uh, say, uh, cities. Then, of course, came the atom bomb in World War II. Two. But in World War I, we, you had bombs. And uh, the Germans were using, uh, say, hundreds of uh, bomber planes coming together and doing. Uh, they showed me in London and Cambridge, you see, how they were destroyed in World War II and how Hitler, today I was reading, reading in the newspaper, uh, Hitler uh, had asked the scientists to prepare an army of mosquitoes. Oh. <laughs> mosquitoes carrying malaria. And they will drop them uh, in a country so that the whole country is wiped out. Uh, suffering from malaria and so on. Look at the man. He was such a vicious, yes. villainous yes. character. Uh, living in history, you saw him. Anyway, uh, that's how it is. Right, sir. So there was disenchantment among these very enthusiasts of Marxism later after the 30s. So we discussed that uh, early 20th century uh, literature, uh, the writing is trying to reflect the decline that is happening. Mm. And uh, the writers are rightfully portraying the current, uh, the current, then current situation of society. And you gave the example of uh, Virginia Woolf and uh, she writes in the stream of consciousness technique. And her writing is clearly uh, very depressive in that sense. Mm. It shows that, you know, something is not going right. If there is not that uh, bud of optimism. So uh, would one, and but it was also said that she was uh, herself schizophrenic and uh, she was uh, mentally disturbed or so. So can we say that uh, her writing reflects both her psychological uh, situation and uh, also the uh, decline that the period is going through? Can we find both these uh, streaks in her work? Well, I think, yes, both are there, but uh, even more than these two, uh, there, is the, uh, uh, there is the question of feminism. Because what she is showing in her novels, it is not the individual psyche alone. It is the gender, sex relationship. And you see how men behave and how women get, uh, you see, uh, isolated. Uh, they have to remain content with their private lives. 
and it is uh, the wages of privacy that at times you turn psychic and many of our characters do because of that sort of oppression but loneliness is also oppression your uh, is a uh, being kept in isolation kept as a sort of prisoner of uh, domestic is a uh, duties and so on so it is that aspect also in virginia Woolf. and that's why you uh, uh, remember she wrote that famous book a room of one's, one's own. own yes she she said a woman needs a room of her own which is symbolic means uh, freedom some space which she can call her own where she can feel free herself and not always defined in terms of someone else mrs so and so mm -hmm. etc etc so uh, that's a very strong side to her and she is in that line started by um, by mary wollstonecraft wollstonecraft who was the mother of mary shelley and she first the, for the first time wrote uh, uh, about the rights of women yes and rights of men also of course yes in relation to the French uh, Revolution. Revolution yes. But I uh, always keep in mind that there were the enlightened males also, male writers, you see, who thought in terms of equality, who thought in terms of women emancipation. You can go as far, uh, of course, leave aside the ancient literature, although even there I find uh, in Plato and so on, uh, this thought. But then medieval times was the worst for the female sex because of Christianity, because of Islam. These two new religions, uh, they were very loudly anti-women. Uh, all these myths, you know, uh, in the Christian myth, woman is not born independently she is born out of man yes out of adam eve comes similarly in greek mythology you know the first man is prometheus and uh, the first woman is pandora and you know pandora's box yes that box is actually uh, the the dowry she brought and when uh, it was open to see what dowry she had brought, there were all the evils, <coughs> sorry, evils of, uh, say, human life. So that's how women are blamed. Eve is blamed for the fall of Adam. Although he fell himself, she, she has no role there. But then she is blamed. Pandora is blamed for all the evils in human life. So uh, uh, these two, and Islam, you know, uh, how hard they are on women, burqa and so on, that they can't uh, uh, have free life, independent life. So uh, that aspect is also there. Yes, sir. And uh, that continues uh, through Virginia Woolf, now, of course, a whole movement. But then uh, uh, the uh, freedom of women uh, in the modernist period uh, came about, but not without a price. You know, in England, in 1865, which was the second reform bill, right, sir. gave voting rights to the working class people, but did not give voting rights to women. And women had to come out in the streets, they had to agitate, they had to go to jails. And it was only after World War I in 1918, uh, in fact, 1922, that they got the voting rights. Voting rights. And even then, not equal. At the age of 35, men at the age of 21, women 35. They again fought. And then, of course, equal rights came. So there is a whole history behind this movement also. 
But that's a part of a modernist movement because it was uh, in the 20s that uh, women rights were also granted. So it, was, it is a part of the modernist movement. Unfortunately, most histories you read, English histories, they leave out this part. And it is all about Eliot Pound, and Joyce, so on, and Lawrence, mm. and nothing about the womenist no. movement. So it is important. In my history, of course, I try to correct some of these things. Rise of uh, uh, women writers also, there is a chapter, and so on. So uh, this must also be included when we talk of modern literature in the early 20th Absolutely, century, sir. the movement of uh, women liberation. Yes. And sir, of course, this had been uh, ongoing in a, uh, perhaps in a smaller way when Jane Austen also comes up with very strong hmm. female characters in her novels. Yeah, Jane Austen comes after Mary Wollstonecraft. Yes. And Mary Shelley is there. Uh, a contemporary of Jane Austen. Yeah, Jane Austen is doing, but uh, not very boldly, of course. Yes. Focusing on women, b bringing them in the forefront. Uh, but then uh, I was talking of the male writers. Think of Chaucer. Yes. To have created a female character like Wife of Bath. Bath. Yes. You see, she takes on the Bible. And she takes on uh, those, uh, as a Christian saint. He says, you can marry uh, so-and-so had 101 wives. <laughs> and she says, why can't uh, I do that? She says, I will. I've had five husbands, and I'll have the sixth one also. <laughs> so a very radical uh, idea. But who creates? Chaucer created her and uh, put those words in her mouth challenging uh, the traditional you see, image of uh, woman. woman. The tyranny on the woman, she is challenging that. Then think of Shakespeare during the Renaissance. You see, uh, you remember uh, Ruskin uh, in the Victorian age said, Shakespeare has no heroes. Shakespeare has only heroines. Because uh, heroes are not there. In tragedies, you have those rascals, murderers, yes. criminals, and so on. In the comedies, it is uh, the women characters who are dominant. Dominating, yes. Rosalind, Rosalind or Portia, and so on. All these women, you say that they are the leading characters. Right, sir. And they are superior uh, morally, intellectually, to, to the male characters. So, anyway. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. We had a wonderful discussion along with a very insightful lecture, very lucid. And uh, we were also given a number of examples. And uh, we, I'm sure we touched on uh, every aspect of early 20th century literature. And uh, as sir also told us, uh, uh, told us modernist literature, also the age of experimentation, bringing about a lot of new ideas. And uh, free, innovative, and frank being the hallmarks of early 20th century uh, literature. So in the next lecture, we are going to uh, look at more of this. And uh, perhaps uh, day after, we are going to look at uh, 20th century literature as well. So I am sure you all will be tuned in. And uh, have a very good day. Hope to see you guys next time. Thank you.